Okay, so we are going to do genetics and look at some very, very basic um, patterns of inheritance. So, you know, you can read the rest of it in your notes about Mendel and how he did that. And you all probably know, you know, he started with the plants and sweet pea plants and all of that. So, in all of us, we have certain characteristics which we call traits. For example, you know, brown hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, freckles, dimples, flat feet, attached or free ear lobes. These are all called traits. And the passing of these traits is known as heredity. And what these traits are really carried on are genes which are present on chromosomes. Okay, so that's the pattern in which this flows. So now these genes are found on chromosomes and as we did when we were doing meiosis, human beings have 46 chromosomes or what are called 23 pairs. Of these, 44 are what are known as autosomes. So 44 or 22 pairs are called autosomes. So 46 is the same as 23 pairs. So autosomes of 44 or what we can say as 22 pairs and the last pair the 23rd pair is a pair of sex chromosomes okay in females this is how they have they have 46 chromosomes 22 pairs of autosomes and the pair of sex chromosomes in females both are x so we write female as, this is the way we write females and you know this is what we write for males, right? So females will be 44XX, males will be 44XY. So the last pair is different. They have one X and one Y and we have one, uh, both our X's. So when gametes are formed, um, you under, when we were talking, you know, about fertilization, and I mentioned this at that time, when a gamete is formed, it, you know, it will be 22 plus X, right? That's the only possible combination. In the male, it could be 22 plus X, or it could be 22 plus Y, which is why if the Y meets the X, you get a boy, if X meets X, you get a girl. So the father who determines um, the sex of the child. So now these genes, what they do is they control the production of proteins and it's these proteins which actually determine traits and every gene controls one specific protein. Um, we have conditions where there are some genes which are extremely strong and we call them dominant genes. Others which are not strong, we call them recessive genes. Dominant genes, when they are present with a recessive gene, they will always mask the recessive gene. It's like they don't allow that recessive gene to be expressed. You know, it's like having a strong man and a weak person. The strong person will always kind of dominate over the weak, so something like that. So they, when the a, a dominant gene is present with a recessive gene, it will not allow the recessive gene to be expressed. The dominant gene will always suppress it or mask it, okay? Traditionally, dominant genes are always, whenever, not everything in the body is as simple as being dominant. Every trait in our body is as simple as being dominant and recessive. There are some which kind of coexist, okay? But in some cases, some traits, uh, for example, the color of hair or maybe height or all this have dominant and recessive traits. So in uh, traditionally, whenever there is a dominant gene expressed, let's say we're talking about height and we represent the gene for height with the letter T, okay, so tall and short, so dominant gene is always written in uppercase and it will be written as a big T and if I, that will tell you that the big T is tall The per, and so if a person has even only just one of the big T's and another tiny T, they will still be tall, okay. The recessive gene that in other words the gene for short is T, so you can see both are for height, so the trait is height. This is the gene for tall. This is the gene for short. Dominant gene is always traditionally written in uppercase. Recessive gene is always written in lowercase. Okay. So this would be short and this would be tall. To give you another example, suppose we talk about freckles. The gene for freckles is dominant and the gene for no freckles is recessive. So gene for freckles we will write with F. And the gene for no freckles will write with little f. So freckles is the trait, okay? So this means 
person has freckles. If they have two of these, they don't have freckles. Okay. Now, for this, these things that I'm representing, tall and short, have freckles or don't have freckles. These are what we say the forms of the gene for the for the trait or characteristic. So this. I can say is the tall form of the gene. This is the short form of the gene for the trait height. This is the having freckles. This is not having freckles for the trait freckles. Okay. So here these uh, most traits in our body are represented by forms which are known as alleles. So this is an allele. This is an allele. And we usually have two forms of the allele. For any trait, we have two forms because we get one from our father and we get one from our mother, right? Now, some traits have multiple alleles. So it's not as simple as just having these two. There may be many more. Uh, skin color is one. Blood groups, as we'll see, is another one. Now, whenever the alleles are very similar, they're exactly alike, we call them homozygous. So it, it is from, you know, if you look at the word homosexual, you know, the same sex, right? So homozygous means same. So you could have two of the big T genes, two of the big F genes, or like I've shown you here, two of big H genes, or you could have two of the small T or two of the small F, right? They are both the same. So we would say here that this would be homozygous. This is also homozygous. We will call this homozygous dominant, right? So that one would be called homozygous dominant because both genes are dominant. This one, what would we call it? Yes, we would call it homozygous recessive just to tell you that both alleles are recessive here. Follow? When they are different... When you have one allele different for the other, they both represent the same trait, but they are different because one is one form, one is the other. Like you have a tall and a short gene together or one for freckles and one without freckles together like this. This is heterozygous, like, you know, the way you can remember heterosexual, different sex. Okay, so this is heterozygous. Can you see this? Now, whenever someone is homozygous dominant this way, they will, the trait will be expressed because, you know, both are dominant genes. When someone is heterozygous, also the trait will be expressed because remember a dominant gene masks a recessive gene. And in order to have a recessive trait expressed, you have to have them as homozygous recessive. Do you understand? There shouldn't be any one dominant gene in the picture, otherwise it will mask it. Everyone follow that? Okay. Then we have two more terms. One, I'll talk about phenotype first. Phenotype is the physical makeup. That is something that you can actually physically describe. So this trait can be described. You can use an adjective for it. It's what you can actually see. So what you can see. All these things that I was telling you, have being tall, being short, Having blonde hair, having brown hair, having blue eyes, having very pale skin, having freckles, not having freckles. See, I'm able to describe it just by looking at that person. So I'm using all these adjectives. I'm saying physically I'm able to describe it. That is known as phenotype. Okay. Genotype is the genetic makeup, which you cannot necessarily tell. For example... You don't know, say for, like I said, that uh, for height, the tall gene is dominant and the short gene represented by little t is recessive. So a person with this would be tall. A person with this also would be tall, right? So when you see a tall person, you don't know whether their alleles are like this or their alleles are like this, isn't it? So that is called the genotype, the genetic makeup, which you sometimes will have to actually do a... Uh, genome study in order to see what their genetic makeup is. In other words, you don't know exactly what kind of alleles they have. Sometimes, of course, you can tell. For example, if I told you that a person was, height is not a very good example because, you know, it depends on which country you are tall and short kind of varies in different countries. But let's say freckles. This is for freckles. This is without freckles. If someone has freckles, that person could be this. Or that person could be this too, right? Because you need only one dominant gene to be present for the trait to be expressed. 
If somebody doesn't have freckles and you say, oh, that person doesn't have freckles, you can automatically conclude that they would be like this. So, you know, sometimes you may be able to tell the genotype, but not always. Okay. So genotype is the genetic makeup, the point that you uh, write as in letters. And phenotype is what you can physically describe. You don't always know the genotype because it could be heterozygous dominant or homozygous dominant, especially when we have a dominant recessive trait. Okay. So let's review this. How many pairs of autosomes are there? Twenty-two, yes. So let's look at some patterns of inheritance. So what I was describing all this while, this dominant and recessive and the uppercase for dominant and the lowercase for recessive, that's what is known as complete inheritance, where, you know, you don't have an in-between thing. It's very black and white. You either, the alleles are either dominant or they're recessive. The dominant gene uh, allele will always mask the recessive allele. In order for the recessive gene to be expressed or the recessive allele to be expressed, it has to be presented in the homozygous recessive form, right? We just saw that. The second one is what is known as incomplete inheritance, seen quite often in plants. This is when neither is dominant nor recessive. So you kind of mix the two. It's like mixing colors. You'll get something in between. For example, in plants, seen extremely well in plants, you take a red uh, flower and um, red hibiscus flower and you, um, you know, you br uh, breed it with, uh, uh, make a hybrid with a red and a white. You'll get a pink. See, it's an in-between. Neither one is dominant, right? So that's, that's why it's called incomplete inheritance. It's also seen in these palomino horses where you take a brown horse and you take a white horse and the palomino which is born has both brown and white in its coat. See, so that's one. Another example as given in your books, but some geneticists actually put this as co-dominance, but we'll go with your book. This is seen in a condition which is known as sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell anemia, what happens is that um, the hemoglobin in sickle cell anemia is kind of, uh, is not properly formed. So it's not able to hold on to oxygen. And these people then have, uh, you know, they suffer from oxygen deficit. And in certain cases, the, the cells also become sickle shaped. And, you know, the red blood cells are round. These cells kind of under low oxygen tension, they get, they become, they look like a sickle and they can, you know, cause a lot of problems. So if the normal gene for hemoglobin is represented by the letter S, the gene for sickle cell anemia is, let's say, is represented by S dash. Okay? So somebody who's like this has normal hemoglobin. They don't suffer from anything. Someone who has both like this, they suffer from sickle cell disease. But someone who has one normal gene and one abnormal gene they su suffer from something known as sickle cell trait where they don't suffer they do suffer from the disease but the disease is not full blown that means it's a much milder form you follow that so they have they have a much milder form of the disease so it's a trait which is a milder form of the disease so that's why the books put it an incomplete inheritance because you know it's not this one doesn't dominate the normal gene doesn't dominate the sickle cell gene because if the sickle cell gene is present you still have some form of the disease then we have another type which is called co-dominance which is where both the alleles if present are expressed and blood typing is a very, very good example. Here we have, you remember when you had blood group A, you had antigen A. If you were blood group B, you had antigen B, right? So here the A and the B antigens are equally dominant. They have equal sort of roles to play. So if A and B are present together, they, you get another blood group. So they co-sort of exist. So this is known as AB group. You got that? So that's why it's called co-dominance. However, in blood groups, we also have a recessive kind of an allele. If someone has blood group O and we represent it like this, the O group is recessive. 
got that so if it is o group is present with the a allele or the b allele the a or the b will express itself you see that so someone with blood group a could have both alleles of a you understand like this or they could have a and o right because o is recessive someone with b would have b or they could be b o get that a b will only have this because they have to have a and b both so they'll be like this what do you think o will be like pardon yes very good so o group will have to have because it's recessive so both alleles have to be o followed so that's co dominance then lastly we have something which is transmitted on those sex chromosomes remember the x and y most of the sex linked diseases are recessive most of them are carried on the x chromosome so what happens is that females because we have two x chromosomes so the other having the other x kind of protects us a little a lot so in order for us to suffer from any sex linked disease both the x chromosomes have to have the defective gene for example let's say and i'll show you examples hemophilia if the normal hemophilia you know is a condition where the clotting factor is absent right clotting factor 8 or 9 and so if the normal hemoglobin is represented by h and the abnormal hemoglobin is represented by little h if a woman has on her one x chromosome she has the normal h and on the other x chromosome she has the defective h this normal sort of masks the recessive so she doesn't suffer from the disease you get that but she has what is known as a carrier state this carrier state is typically mentioned only for sex linked diseases so it's what you mean by carrier state is that she doesn't suffer from the disease but she carries the disease which she can transmit to her daughter or her son followed for a guy since this he, this hemophilic gene is only present on the x chromosome with a guy if he has the normal gene he's fine but let's say he inherits the abnormal gene from the mother like this he will get the disease because the y doesn't have anything so he doesn't have another x to protect him you see so he will definitely suffer from the disease so he can never be a carrier he will always either suffer from the disease or he'll be normal and he always gets it from the mother because remember the y comes from the dad the x has to come from the mother right have you all understood this part okay so let's now do a few of these so first we'll do sex determination and complete and a complete inheritance where we are doing dominant and recessive okay so let's do sex inheritance first so i have these squares called punnett squares these are known as punnett squares punnett squares that's what it's called so i have these already made out so here is the female gamete so this side is the female gamete so in any case it can only be x and here is the male gamete so it could be either a sperm with the x chromosome or a sperm with the y chromosome so what we do is we kind of mix them like this we go this way then we mix this with this and take this with this so in any pregnancy there are four possible four possibilities right either this x can meet this x so you will get xx or this x can meet this x you'll get xx either this x can meet this y so you'll get xy or this x can meet this y you get xy do you see that so there are four possibilities of these you can see there's a 50% chance that it will be a girl in any pregnancy and 50% chance that it will be a boy right okay because if we say each is 25% there are four so 50% chances that it's a girl 50% chances that it's a boy this is how sex would be determined at conception now let's look at i gave you some i mentioned some example let's look at this say that i'm i give you this information that the gene for dimples is dominant for you know the presence of dimples on the cheek and we represent it by capital d okay and i give you this problem i mean this is the way it will be presented in your test 
So I take, I'll give you this, that the gene for dimples is dominant, represented by the letter D. And I also tell you that the parents are heterozygous. In this case, I've mentioned this. Otherwise, I might say the mother has dimples and is homozygous. So that means she will be like this, isn't it? If I say she's homozygous and has dimples. Or if I say the father does not have dimples, then you know that the father has to be like this. Okay, so you know, you'll get different scenarios. You've understood that, right? Now I'm just telling you that the both parents are heterozygous. So in other words, both parents have dimples, right? So mother also will be like this. So this side we can do mother and this side, uh, father and this side mother. It doesn't matter which way. And traditionally, we always put the uppercase letter before the lowercase. It just makes it easier for us to see. And, you know, so here is how... Uh, we are only worried about these so when the gamete is formed it will split like this so the gamete may have the D gene or may not or may have the little D gene right D and D it will split like this D and D got it so these are the possibilities right this D and this D this D and this D this D and this D this and this right okay so now if we have you followed how this happens? So if we were to ex express as genotype and phenotype and say it in terms of percentage. So let's see, is this person going to have dimples? Yes, right? Is this person going to have dimples? This one? This one? No. So phenotypically I can say that 25% will not have dimples, right? Would I be right saying that? 25% will not have dimples and 75% chances of children having dimples, right? Understood? Everybody? See, each is, there are four, right? So if you take out of 100, four, each is 25%. So 25, 50, 75. So 75% chance that a child will be born with dimples because any one of these four possibilities at any pregnancy and 25% that there will be no dimples. If you were to express the genotype as a percentage, I can say 25% could be this way, right? This one. These two are similar. 50% would be this way, right? And 25% this way. Have you followed? You've understood, right, how, how we, we do these squares? So this would be homozygous dominant. This would be heterozygous. This would be homozygous recessive. Okay? Let's go to the next one. So next one, we were doing this incomplete dominance where I gave you that palominos were the one, you know, where, so you had, you know, a horse which had... Um, brown as well as white in it. So let's say you cross a brown horse and you cross a white horse. So here I have the brown horse like this and the white horse this way. So when we cross them, so what will be the phenotype here? Pardon? Yeah, so they'll be 100% of what we call palominos, right? Brown and white mixture. And as the genotype, I would write, right? Okay? So 100% heterozygous or 100% BW? Now let's look at the other type with sickle cell anemia where I'm telling you that the normal hemoglobin is represented by the letter S. Sickle cell anemia, the allele for that is represented with this S with a dash. And then I also tell you that there are two heterozygous parents and they are pregnant and we let's see what are the possibilities. So if they are heterozygous, they are going to be like this. This way, isn't it? So they both have the traits. They have a mild form of the disease, isn't it? So now let's see what happens. So I'll take this and this. Then I'll take this and this. It doesn't matter whether you put this S in front of this. It just makes it easier to put, you know, normal before the thing. This and this. So I'll put this as this. And then this and this. So 
So now, phenotypically tell me what percent of children will be normal? 25, okay. 25% will be normal. What percent of children will have the trait? 50% will have the trait, right? Because this one and this one will have the trait, the mild form of the disease, right? And what percent will have the full-blown disease? 25. 25 will have the full-blown disease, which is this person here, right? Okay? And genotypically, we have to write, we'll write 25% as SS, 50% as S and S dash, and 25% as S dash and S dash. Right? Okay? Let's look at co-dominance. So, as I explained to you, the A allele and the B allele are, they are dominant together. O is recessive. So, as I mentioned, the blood group A could either be homozygous like this or it could be heterozygous like this. Blood group B could be either two Bs or a B and O. Blood group AB is just AB and blood group O will have to have two O's, right? So now I'm saying that one parent, I give you this information, one parent is heterozygous A, which means they have to be written like this. And one is homozygous B which means we'll write it like this, okay? And then I ask you, what are the possible blood groups of the children that could be born? So we could get this. Right? So what are the possible blood groups that the children could have? Yes, A, B or B group, right? So you can actually rule out whether someone is the father or not. But you can never definitely say it's not. So if the mother, for example, was um, A, O and say the father was O group. Now the children can only be A, B or over here like this, right? So let's see, let's look at this. So can we say whether whether the father... This person with the O group, whether he could be the father or not. So you can only rule out that this person cannot be the father, but you can never say this person can or can't. So let me give you this example. So I'm telling you the child is born with B group and there's another child who's born with AB group. These are the only two possibilities we are, I mean, what we see, AB or B. And they can come when, if these are the things. We know that the mother is like this, right? So let's say if the father was actually O group, Okay. So, what will happen? In this case, if these parents, if these two were the parents, the children can only be either A or O group, right? But there we saw the child, the children were A, B or B group, right? So, we can say, okay, this guy is not the father, someone else is the father. So, you can only rule out paternity, but you can't say definitely you know, whether this person is or isn't, the, uh, this person is the father, okay? So that's uh, how blood groups are, you know, used for paternity. I mean, now they do a lot more uh, testing, but that this is just a very simple way of finding out. So here is sex-linked inheritance. So let's say the normal gene, so we're looking at hemophilia here. So the normal gene, the allele is H, it's an uppercase H. The hemophilic gene, because it's a recessive gene, it's written as lowercase h. And I'm saying that the father is hemophilic and the mother is normal. So now because it's sex linked, I have to use the X and the Y thing. And then on top of them, I have to write the G, uh, these alleles, right? So I said the mother is normal. So the mother would be XX. And so both her Xs, when they, they will have the normal gene. I said the father is hemophilic. So he's X with the little h and y. The y doesn't have the gene on it. The, so, these are the possibilities. Okay? 
none of the children will suffer from hemophilia isn't it none of the children will suffer from hemophilia the boys will be absolutely normal but the girls will be carriers right because they've got one of these defective genes and the defective gene can only be transmitted through the mother so the boy gets it from the mother right so this father he must have got it from his mother okay get it because the x chromosome for a boy comes from the mother only so that's why the defective gene sits on the x chromosome so you can only get it from the mother okay so we can try another one so let's say the a uh, woman is a carrier so let's say we put this as a woman is a carrier and the a man is hemophilic so now we will get this so this one is a carrier this one suffers from the disease we don't we don't use the word carrier when you say carrier and sex link she doesn't suffer from the disease she she only carries the one defective gene here she suffers from the disease okay and here this boy is normal this boy is suffering from hemophilia so we can see that 50% possibility that children will suffer from the disease 25% that one child will, the child will be or the boy will be normal and here 25% that he, one of the children will be a carrier okay okay why do you think only the mother passes on x linked diseases to the son the son can get the x chromosome only from the mother the x sex link the not that the father has x, the the x link disease hemophilia color blindness or x link so the father does have the x link disease but for the son the x comes from the mother the y comes from the father any recessive x link trait requires a daughter to inherit a gene from both the mother and the father is that true or false it is true and just to uh, so that means she has to get the defective gene both from the mother and the father so let's look at this example i gave you uh oh i wiped it out so i said let's say that the mother was a carrier so here this is how it was so this this child is a carrier this girl is a carrier this girl however suffers from the disease so can you see she gets one defective gene from the mother and she gets one from the father so she has to get it from both do you see that so therefore she has to get it from both so she has to inherit a gene from both the mother and the father 